to join along, you can. There's not the slides are more just a reference for you guys. Um, we won't spend a whole lot of time talking through this stuff, as um, we'll spend a lot of time just playing. So my contact information is up there. Feel free to reach out to me at any time. I'm happy to try to answer questions the best I can about the spirit stuff. But if you need to, definitely don't be afraid to reach out to me. So I, uh, it's listed up there. I actually have I do one other thing other than fifth grade now. So I. Our district calls it an instructional design strategist, technology and innovation, which is essentially like an innovation or tech coach. So I get to teach in the morning and I get to do uh, some work with some other teacher in the afternoon. Uh, so it's a little bit different gig. Um, I started working with Spiros. It's been a few years back that I started playing with them. Um, Use them with first graders all the way through sixth graders into, into junior high as well. So hopefully you're able to take away at least maybe one idea of where you could find a fit for this in your curriculum. Plus, I know right after lunch, if you're like me, I'm ready to take a nap after eating. So hopefully we can get you up and get you moving. And hopefully this doesn't um, work your brain too much. I know my brain right now is already full after just the morning sessions of trying to get all that content, wrap my head around things. So um, with this, there's a couple things. Uh, Spiros kind of changed and evolved over time. Uh, so all of the Spiros that are in the back are white, which are the 2.0 version. Um, there's a newer version that they came out with that's clear, which is pretty cool for kids to be able to see through. So this is the Spark version, and then there's a newer one yet that's called Spark Plus that actually doesn't have like a white line, it has a blue line. And then the little logo on the front is actually blue. There's not a whole lot that's different between Spark, Spark Plus, and then the 2.0. Um, I haven't seen the Spark Plus, but it sounds like it's just clear, a little bit more clear. This plastic that they use um, is a little bit better quality, I guess. So um, you can't get in less than a Sphero 2.0. So if you're kind of thinking about these, uh, these themselves usually are about $130. Uh, there's a lot of times around Christmas where they go on sale for about $100. If you buy them in bulk, so if you buy a kit of 10, you usually save. So you get them at $100 per robot compared to $130 per robot. Uh, some other ways of uh, acquiring these, if, it, it's, if it's a budget thing, uh, I was able to get uh, a couple extras for my own by running like a Sphero camp in the summertime for kids. So their price to come to the camp actually covered the cost of the robot. So they actually got a brand new robot that they got to keep then. Um, and then there was just a little bit extra that instead of paying myself, I just used to buy some more robots. So it actually worked out pretty good to get a couple extra robots. I got to play with some kids in the summertime. It was a good fun time for them to kind of explore some of the things with these. But it was just another way, if you're trying to think, how can I get these? It sounds like a lot of money. That's maybe another resource for you. Um, so the Spark side of things, when, when uh, Sphero uh, first launched, they didn't have the Spark side of it. It was just, hey, here's this cool robot. And they, didn't, they, they knew that their big bang for their buck would be finding a way to uh, allow teachers and students to be able to utilize this. Uh, and they've done a really good job of trying to crowdsource information so that you guys can uh, have a lot of resources at your disposal so you don't have to try and reinvent the wheel of utilizing these. So with some of this stuff that I'll show you, some of it is going to utilize the robot just in free drive. And uh, where I think the most value comes with the Spiro is the coding side of it where you can actually program the robot and control a little bit more. So it's cool to drive. A lot of the kids, when they're getting their feet wet with it, just want to drive and see kind of how it functions before they actually get into the coding part of it. So. With this, Sphero actually has some built lessons that they uh, originally created. However, if you go to their website, they're not there anymore. So in the presentation is actually a link. What I did is I downloaded them all and saved them into a Google Drive folder. So they actually have, we'll see if the internet will cooperate. If it doesn't, know that they're there. So they actually have some STEM lessons already built as well as some. So Macro Lab is an older version of an app and I'll show you a little bit different version, but it still works the same. It still applies the same regardless of kind of the app they're using to control it. And there is some middle school lessons in there. So they do a really good job of walking you through step by step of how do I actually use this. It's pre-made lesson. So if you're just trying to get your feet wet with it again, these are a great resource for you. So those are pre-made. You can't really find them on their website anymore, but again, that link in the presentation will take you directly to that Google Drive folder. So this is just an example. Uh, I teach social studies in the mornings with uh, three fifth grade classes. And they're not too excited about social studies, and I'm not really either yet. 
Um, so I, it's my goal to try to find ways to make it exciting for not only me, but for them as well. So one of the things we were talking about was latitude versus longitude. And so to get them out of their seats and practice it, we made a little grid on a poster and then they had to program the robot to navigate to certain coordinates on the actual grid. So I gave them four different coordinates and if they were, some of them figured it out that the four coordinates I gave them were actually a square. So if they were able to make the connection that squares have four equal sides, it made it a little bit simpler to make the code do what they wanted. The second, if they successfully completed the square, uh, we moved on to the next four coordinates and if they were able to kind of problem solve, it was actually the shape of a rectangle. So it was, they were practicing some of the coordinates like I wanted them to, but they're also having to use some coding and we'll see if this will play. This is just an example of kind of what the end result looked like. Or did I not make it a video? There it goes. So that was one example of them using the Sphero for uh, coordinate practice. There was no background before, so this is the first year I'd done this with fifth graders, and I gave them pretty much no real explanation of how to do things. I said, you got a roll command that'll make a roll, you have a delay command that'll make it kind of stop momentarily so that you don't round off your corners. And they figured it out. So don't feel like you need to be the expert on this. They figured out a lot more of this, and some of the stuff I'll show you is an example of that that I had this summer when I worked with some kids on it. So don't feel like really intimidated that if you don't know coding, you don't really need to know much other than being able to facilitate some conversations with students. Sorry, like that. Again. So that was one example uh, that we did with some students. This is another. We just actually a whole district did an ed camp this past Friday, and so I brought these out. And the, the teacher that's on the right is uh, an art teacher, and she said, "Hey, can we paint with these?" Sure, go for it. So she broke out some paint and started rolling around making some abstract paint. So she's already got ideas rolling around her head of. Wow, now I can tie in coding with painting. And they are waterproof too. So if you're wanting to, so she was kind of concerned about it. I said, no, you can wash them off. Just throw them in the water, they'll be fine. Um, they're made out of a really, really hard plastic too, so that if you drop them, they're gonna be fine. So there's not really a huge issue with waterproof or indestructible essentially is what they will do for you. Um, another example of this, we have a fifth grade teacher that's talking about the solar system and he's going to check these out and have the students create the solar system and program them to practice their uh, revolutions around the sun. Uh, another example, just to get your minds thinking about some of the stuff, uh, shuffleboard. Now, the reason I put this up here is you're kind of wondering, okay, how do I connect this to my class? So the way that we did this is we actually just divided them up into two teams They had to work together and program the robot to roll down and land on a certain spot. You can put whatever you want in those shapes. So you can put math facts in there, you can put um, where they have to spell words. So maybe there's different letters in each little box. And maybe it's just them programming it to go to the correct letters to spell their word. Um, you could do, like I said, some, so it doesn't have to be like just single digits. You could put like square root of 100 as a math fact, if they land on that, you have positive and negative, so then they're actually calculating that stuff as they're programming it. So um, again, they're working on the coding stuff and actually having some fun and playing at it too. So here's just some different examples. I won't go and explain those, but it's just a link to some different videos that show some of the things that have happened and some of the uh, courses that they've actually gotten to navigate. We did chariot building in fifth grade two years ago. So they had to research what a chariot was and how it was used in history. And then they actually had to use the engineering design process to create a model. And then they actually had to go and then execute that and build their chariot. And so then after they built their chariot, we put it onto the Sphero, we taped out a course on the floor and then they got to race them around the classroom itself. So these are some of their chariots that they designed. They had to have a charioteer, which was just a little marshmallow that we used. They had to have a yoke that would set on the Sphero, but not permanently attached to it. And so these are some of the examples of them. And for this, they just were free driving. So they didn't do a ton of coding for this. So some of them were really slow. So that one just got disqualified because it got crashed and burned. So that was just a fun way. They were still learning a lot by researching, but they were still having a good time of having to work collaboratively with each other to build those uh, chariots. So baseball, there is a baseball course out there. The board itself, 
Um, I think that material maybe costs, I think, less than ten dollars to make that. So all I did is, it's just a piece of plywood from Lowe's, and then there's a little piece of wood for the let the edge that goes around it. Uh, I drilled some holes and then got crafty and tried to paint. And so you play it just like baseball. So they have to coat it to land on the board. If it goes in first base, it's a single. If it goes in second, it's a double. Home runs. If they get it on the board but it doesn't go in any of them, it's an out. So two teams code away, have them try to land on it. What's funny though is when I've done this with students is they finally started to figure out that technically they could get it to land on the board, but sometimes it didn't go in the hole. So they added extra code to make it start to move and shake. And so eventually it would shake really slow and end up in one of those. So they, they found ways to kind of beat the system. Although we finally said, all right, you can't add a loop that makes it run forever. You can do a loop for five times or something along those lines. So baseball is one that's kind of fun for them to go through and play. Bags, good old tailgating game. Might as well get some kids started on it early. So same system. They can get three points for going into the main hole, and then they get one point if it lands on the board. If they knock them off, they can knock each other off too. Um, same thing, kids got figured out that they could land on the board and then add extra code to make it shake and move around until it got in. Croquet, um, those are just green ramps, and then that's coat hangers that came over the top that were bent, and then the legs are just like 3D printed legs. Um, and then they have to coat it to play just like your traditional game of croquet. So they still have to program to actually play the game. So some of those others they can free drive, but uh, program it. There's bowling out there. If you want to play bowling and program, play bowling. Um, I put golf on here. I think the golf app is on some of them. The way the golf app works is you get to kind of build a course if you want. Otherwise, it's kind of got a pre-built course, and it's not like a physical course you can see. You just specify if it's a par three, and so you could tape out a course on the on the floor. And what they do is they can choose from a driver, an iron, or a putter, and based on how much you flick your finger on the screen is how far it'll roll. So I've seen it done where a lot of schools have had their students actually design a golf course and then start to apply some of their math content area skills that they've been learning to actually design the course according to some certain scale elements. And then they actually had the chance to go and then play their course with the Spiros. Uh, zombie tag, the way zombie tag is played is if you have a contained area, one person starts out as a zombie, so they change their robot to the color red, and the rest of the kids are green, and then they take turns creating a program that tries to go away from the zombie, but the zombie tries to hit them, and then if they get hit, they have to change to red. So slowly it's just last one standing. So you can have a design space that says you have to stay in here. They like to play where they can just free drive, but if you actually force them to code it, then they're starting to wrap their head around what it takes to drive the robot using code. So kind of the nuts and the bolts of how it works. All the Sphero, since it is a sphere, has a tail light. So on those back there when you guys grab them, the easiest way to get them to turn on is if you just knock on them twice, they should turn on. And so those flash colors for a little bit, you can notice it's trying to stabilize itself. So it's always trying to make sure that it's balanced so that the motor's never there on the bottom. It'll glow white, and those will do a better job of showing you that it's white once it's connected to an iPad. So the way that the taillight works, uh, the app that I'll show you guys and have you guys use is called it's called Lightning Lab. So this has kind of been one of the big game changers for Sphero is that they have this website now that is kind of a crowdsourcing website for people to add programs and activities. And if you've ever used Scratch, you can take Scratch programs and pull them in and remix them and make their, your own. So same concept for Lightning Lab. The way it works is there's programs that are already crowdsourced and shared on the website. And if I want to pull one on there and see what it does, I can pull it on and play with it and I can remix it and make it my own to see kind of how things work. Another element of it too is that as a teacher I can create a virtual class. Kids can join my virtual class and then I can assign like different activities for them to complete. And so they can go through and complete them and then check them off. So I'll show you a little bit about that too, but with the tail light, uh, while this is loading, a couple things that you might have happen. It says the Sphero is connecting, it might end up saying that the Sphero uh, is connected, but you're not getting any control out of it. For sometimes, what I've ran into is the Bluetooth, for whatever reason, stops communicating. So what we've found is if you close all the apps, so if you just double click and close the app out and then go back into the app, it solves the problem. 
So with the app itself, to kind of explain, because I'll have you guys use this app on the iPads back there. At the bottom, you have home programs, activities, and drive. So if you really want to drive, but you don't really want to worry too much about the code, you just want to come have some fun and drive, just click on drive itself. And by clicking on drive, you get to change the color if you want to change the color. This is how you can change the power for how much you're going to have it with speed wise. And then on the left hand side, it says to aim. So that's the key part where that's probably one of the biggest challenges I've seen with students. The tail light is not the little logo, which a lot of kids will think it's the logo. When you press aim, it'll turn all the lights off except for a tail light. There we go. So now there's actually a tail light. <coughs> how it's going to stay in that one spot. So a lot of kids think they can spin it with their hands to get the tail light to move but you can't. You have to actually put your finger on the circle and hold down and move your finger in a circle until the tail light, what we always tell them is that it needs to face you. So if it faces you, so once it's facing you, now it knows that away from you is zero degrees, to the right is 90, and so on in a complete circle. So this is where they have to start using some angles to help figure out which direction they're going to go. And if you want to change colors, you can change the colors of it. So that's the free drive. So now if I move the joystick up, it'll roll away from me and same thing. If I came back, it'll come back to me right and left. It's easier to control if it's less speed. If you go full speed, the problem is that if you try to turn right, it keeps wanting to go in the same direction instead of being able to turn. So it takes a little bit more to round off your turns instead of making sharp, sharp turns. Um, up at the top, you have some options, but when I click on activities or programs, it gives you even more options. So if I click on activities, it tells me I can look at the ones that I am currently working on. So as a student, if they had some that they were working on, they would show up here and they can create their own accounts too. So then they can sign in and out of that account so their work stays with them. So if you have shared devices in the classroom, it's great because they can have their work available to them. Plus, if they wanted to go home and work on it at home, then they can log in at home and access it as well. But here's where if you're really thinking, okay, this sounds great, but I don't know what else to do. Sphero actually has a bunch of activities they've already created. And just those one, two, and three do a great job of explaining things to where it has, you can see there I had the ability to sign it, but it has the ability to kind of walk you through some things. And they do have video tutorials that kind of go step by step by step through this process. So they go through steps, they have you kind of go uh, quick through it to where So the way that this is, this is just a game that they can then program. Yeah, I got you. So the way with this game, this game was designed to where you toss it and you're trying to guess what the animal was before you catch it. Another one that they have in here, so if I wanted to go into, not their activities, but if I, actually I'll say it really quick, the community is where everyone else shares their activity. So Sphero has designed a few, which you can see there's a few there, but when you click on community, that's where a large majority of the activities are at. So there's tons and tons. So there's a gentleman that made one for the sports trials that has them creating a maze and how you can add some other elements to it. But if you go through, there's tons and tons of activities here. So you can see if you're trying to get some ideas, Here's a great starting point to find some ideas of how other teachers have used it in their classroom. That's within the app? It's within the app and it's also on the, on the website. So it's called Lightning Lab. So if you actually go search Lightning Lab, it'll actually look almost identical on the computer as it would the iPad. And they talk back and forth. So if I'm signed in on the iPad, so if I was to create a brand new program called iTech, so now I'm creating a program on the iPad. So 
But then on the computer itself, if we just go to Lightning Lab, it'll end up looking pretty much the same. So now if I click on Program, sorry, I should click on my Programs. So I'm not signing on my iPad, so it's not showing up for you. So I won't go through signing, but if, if the kids are signing on the iPad, their apps will show up there. But if they wanted to add programs in from the community, so if I went to the community, there's tons of programs that I can add in. And it lets you, so if there was, let's see. So if I wanted to, this is the little cap on this image, and it'll go crazy too. So it was just a little code that somebody made. So now I can take that and I can start changing things on here and make them different according to what I want. So now kids can kind of self-teach if they just go through and play with some of these little buttons on here, the little code blocks. It lets them then kind of figure out some of the others. So they have games in here, so I kind of showed you the hot potato one, so essentially it's just plain hot potato. So it'll start where it's green and then there's actually, you toss it to somebody. And so the goal is to not be hanging on to it when it changes red. Oh, bummer. <laughs> so if you think about, okay, how, that's great, but how do kids use it? So if you think about game design for kids and, and having to problem solve, they could create, uh, use writing in that process to design a game through writing. So create a template by writing, and then actually try to transition into how do I actually build that game to reflect what I wrote. So with this, to get out and play, I don't have, I have 17 robots that are back there. So there's, it's probably gonna be best to work with a partner or with groups of three. Um, if you wanna kind of go through some of the programming side of it, I'm happy to stay in and talk to you or answer questions out there, but I want you guys to have plenty of time just to play and get your hands wet instead of sitting and trying to listen to a bunch of stuff. Uh, the only thing that I didn't explain, there is some ramps back there, so you can try to get it up onto the ramps. There's one, um, just draw like, oh, one chariot. So if you wanna get some fun video, the chariot itself attaches, and I'll pull this piece out. Your phones, if you want, will fit in there. And then you can hit record and then drive around and get some pretty cool video that way. Um, the croquet blocks are back here. There's tape out there. Um, I didn't put this up there, but one of the things, if you put one ball on each side, you can play capture the flag. So driving it, you can. And this is more of a team effort, so it's interesting to see kids try to team up and how can they problem solve to get the partner's ball or their other team's ball and get it across the midline. So it forces them to go really slow and partner up and push at the same time. So I'll put those out there if you want to play as well. Um, what other questions do you guys have before you get going? All those will have Lightning Lab on it. You should just be able to knock on it a couple times. Should turn on. Um, if you just want to drive in Lightning Lab, just click on Drive at the very bottom once you're in the app. If you want to work on programming, just create a new program. The big blocks that you really need to know about are the role blocks. So if you're really trying to create a program, just come in and click the plus sign to create a new one. And then once you're inside of the program, the role block down at the very bottom, which is going to be underneath Actions, is really the only block that you should need to play with. And if you click on those bubbles, it'll kind of explain what those bubbles <coughs> each one's doing. All right. Do you have a question? Do you host them, like give one spot, and then you just check them out? Can you share them, or do people? Yeah, so good question. So all the ones that are back there in a plastic tub, those are, so our district bought uh, 10 of them. 
So they bought uh, one of the discounted bundles. And so we have them in three individual containers. So there's four kits in each container and teachers can check out all of them or they can check out one or they can check out four. Um, the other ones are ones that I've acquired over the years um, for things. So we do have ones that are available for checkout, um, but they haven't been used a lot yet, but a lot of teachers, we just got them, so a lot of teachers haven't been made aware of them yet. Yes, you're telling me a bit, go for it. <laughs> <laughs>